Hey guys, welcome back. Ashley D. Will here, author, teacher, life coach. I hope everyone is doing well. So today's topic is called Forgiving Yourself. We've talked in other videos about forgiving others. We've talked about forgiving God. And now in this one, we're going to talk about forgiving yourself. And I'm going to give you a personal example. All right. So did you know that forgiving yourself is very important? There are three different people that we can have forgiveness issues with. Forgiveness can apply to other people, offenses, betrayals, wounding, sins, etc., etc. Forgiveness can apply to God. We can have a need to forgive Him in our own hearts because we're holding something against Him or judging Him. And we can have a resentment there, even though he's done nothing wrong, right? He's the eternal, perfect being, the life source. But in our own hearts, we can have issues of unforgiveness toward God. And then just as important as these two is forgiveness of the self. We hold things against ourselves that we've done and said. We judge and condemn ourselves for things that we have done and said. And in that, we're sinning against ourselves, and we don't know that. And that I talk about in the Ending the War with Myself playlist, classes 1 through 10, and that in particular is in Chapter 3. We focus in on that. But the self is just as important to forgive as God and other people. You need to know that. Okay? In the process of forgiveness, there are three main steps, three points you want to be sure and cover. If you just say, oh, I forgive. I don't want to think about it anymore. Then it's kind of a superficial cursory, you know, and you can not feel like you've forgiven if when you do it that way. So just FYI, this is how to go deep and to get it all out. So first you would forgive the person whether it's another person or the Lord or the self, you would forgive that person. Then the second part of it, see here you're just forgiving them as a being. Number two is you're forgiving the specific things that they did or did not do. And you can list them specifically on a page and it can fill up many pages especially if it was a parent or a sibling or a longtime friend, this list of every little thing you can make can be lengthy. And the nitpickiness, and it may be sounding legalistic, but in the spirit, forgiveness is a legal transaction. So it's okay and it's actually even good to go through and list and nitpick every little thing that you need to forgive. Because why? If you don't list it and acknowledge it, then how can you forgive it? See? So it's still inside you and that resentment will still be there for those issues that you don't bring up, the actions or the omissions. So see, this piece is very important. Thirdly, many people will overlook this or don't even know about it, but the consequences of the actions or omissions that the person did or didn't do are huge. They can even last a lifetime. So imagine if you're driving along and you got hit by a drunk driver and from that moment on you've been a paraplegic or quadriplegic. You can't walk. Okay, so you say, oh, I forgive them. But every day you're in that wheelchair and this resentment is in you and you don't understand why you still feel that toward them and toward your situation because you've already forgiven them. Oh, I forgive them. See how a superficial cursory forgiveness is not complete and how you're still reaping what you've sown in unforgiveness by not going all the way down. So the consequences that can last a lifetime could be you have a broken heart that has been so broken that it has taken you over 20 years to recover from things that have happened to you. That's my case. You may be in a wheelchair 
you may be an alcoholic because you haven't been wanting to deal with the issues and the traumas and the complex traumas you've been through as a child and you would have to forgive the alcoholism that you're currently struggling with which you're running to because it's too painful to deal with the issues that you have see it can be anything so just know that this consequences number three is huge and yes the consequences can last the rest of your life so be sure and ask the Lord to reveal expose show me what are the consequences all the consequences related to what this person did or didn't do what are the consequences in my life I want to go ahead and forgive them for those because I don't want this resentment left in me I want to forgive all the way down to the root because forgiveness sets a prisoner free little did I know the prisoner was me when you really forgive you are set free you are free and it feels so good so I'm encouraging you to acknowledge the forgiveness that you need and go all the way with it the person, the actions or omissions, and all of the consequences. And they can be many, and they can be hidden. So ask the Lord to show you what the consequences are. And you can forgive those, and then you will feel that you've truly forgiven. Okay, my personal example, this is on page 51. And this is a struggle that I had years ago and I recorded it a little bit in um, my book. I had to condense so much down because <clears throat> it was originally like 500 pages. <laughs> so I had to cut it down to be around 300. But anyway, I put in what I could. And so what had happened is when I was age 19, I was living in Paris and I ended up having an abortion. I found out I was pregnant and had an abortion. And so there's a long story behind that, but this is not the video for that. We're just focusing on the forgiveness part here. So the abortion that I had, um, it really affected me, okay? I could not forgive myself, and I could not and I would not. I was choosing not to because it felt wrong. It felt wrong for me, and... The reasons why it felt wrong were because of my pride. My pride would not allow me to forgive myself. Secondly, my self-righteousness would not allow me to forgive myself. Thirdly, my standard, I didn't know any of this at the time, I had put above God's standard whoa talk about pride and self-righteousness right well that's what I had done and I didn't know it and then later the Lord showed me that murder was part of the testimony we know of Moses David and especially of Paul so in that murder that I committed it was me, I was the person. The actions were murder first degree and conspiracy to murder. And the omission was not saying no. The consequences were a spirit of death descended upon me after that time, very heavy, very dark, and I was reaping what I had sown and a depression was on me for a very long time and I had to work through a lot of things that were related to that so that is what I had to forgive the life that I had taken everything about that life was gone so I had a lot of forgiveness to do but it was mainly forgiveness of myself and I was stuck I couldn't do it and I was asking the Lord Help me, show me what to do, show me what's blocking me so I can move past this. So, as I proceeded, my heart demanded 
it, this was the only possibility that I demanded to the Lord. This is the only option. And I was sharing what my heart was feeling. I demanded that I be crucified just like Christ was forever. Literally crucified forever. That was the only thing that would, for me, that would make it right. And so the Lord, after I had just cried this out to him and, and insisted on this, for the longest time, there was a silence. I had poured my heart out and I was just waiting. And it was, I don't remember exactly how long, it must have been a, a couple of, two or three weeks. And he answered me. He answered this prayer where I demanded that I be crucified forever, literally. That was the only thing that I could, only way I could cope with it. So he answered me in the spirit. He said, you can be crucified in me. This is on page 51, and I'll read you this, just one part here. Um, at a retreat many years ago, I recalled and recorded on sheets of notebook paper every last sin I could ever remember committing, including this abortion, which was the biggest one in my experience. I became obsessed with riddance of them and the accompanying heavy burden. I read them out loud over and over in confession. Then I tore them up into little pieces. Then I sprinkled them into the fire. There was a fireplace burning in this retreat center and everyone else had gone to another area to do something and I couldn't go. I just stayed behind by myself with the Lord. So I tore them up into little pieces, then I sprinkled them in the fire. As I watched them burn, I declared to God that I should be nailed to a cross forever for all the evil things I had done, namely the abortion that I could not forgive myself for. And then later, one of the first times he spoke to me, he said, you can be crucified in me. So that was how it happened. And I recorded that in my book. But I want you to notice that in his reply to me, he was echoing exactly what I had requested. He did not give me one trace of condemnation. Remember in John 8, 11, the woman caught in adultery. The Pharisees were doing the right thing. They were going to stone her. But Jesus came on the scene and dealt with them in some ways. And then he said, I do not condemn you to the woman caught in adultery. Right? Well, that's what he said to me. It was never even mentioned. There was no rebuke of me, of what I had done. No, nothing. None of that. And then he agreed with me. He agreed with my demand, my request. Right? He agreed with me. And in this, he appealed greatly to my abandonment wounds. Do you see that? I demanded that I be crucified forever, literally. And he replies to me, you can be crucified in me. That appealed to my abandonment wounds because he was inviting me to join him in his crucifixion. And there is intimacy there. And there is closeness there. He also appealed to my need for deep connection. Now, if that's not a deep connection, I don't know what is. That's the deepest connection that anyone can have with anyone is to be crucified in Christ with the Lord. So he was doing all of this in this one answer to my prayer. Also, later, I had found a necklace that my grandmother had given me when I was confirmed. I was 12 years old. I got confirmed in the Episcopal Church. And then another, uh, it was a cross she gave me. And then my mother had given me a tiny cross. And I wasn't sure which one to wear. And I decided to put them both on a gold chain that I had. And he showed me in that choice that I had made that that was him 
moving inside me to do that because I have it on now. The big cross represents the Lord and the little cross on top of it represents me being crucified in him. So these two crosses are an image of this answer to prayer that he gave me all those years ago. So if you are having trouble forgiving yourself for something, tell the Lord about it. Let him interact with you. Let him be a part of that forgiveness process. He wants to be involved in that. He wants to help you along and answer your prayers and show you things so that you will be drawn closer to him and have a deeper walk with him. All right? So forgiving yourself, just in review, is just as important as forgiving other people and forgiving God. The self is very important. Don't neglect forgiving yourself. You're going to forgive yourself, what you did, what you didn't do, and all the consequences. And they can be many, and they can be hidden, and they can be ongoing for the rest of your life. The murder one and conspiracy to murder that I committed at age 19 could not forgive myself. When we can't forgive ourselves or won't forgive ourselves, these are hiding pride. Judgment and condemnation of ourselves goes with that. Self-righteousness goes with that. And when we're not choosing to forgive ourselves, we're putting our standard above God's. Go read Isaiah 14, 14. And see who that sounds like. Okay? Moses, David, and especially Paul committed murder in the scriptures. They were greatly used by God. Again, I demanded that I be crucified forever. There's nothing else that would suffice for me, for my heart. And he answered me specifically in direct response and reply to that request that demand. You can, yes, he said. He agreed with me. Yes, you can be crucified in me. The crucified life, Galatians 2.20. He was answering my prayer and agreeing with me with not one trace of condemnation. John 8.11, no rebuke at all. He agreed with me. This is unbelievable. He appealed to my abandonment wounds. And he appealed to my need for deep connection. And then he gave me kind of a reminder. He led me to bring about an image in my life that is a reminder. Like planting a tree or doing something like that. That's what this necklace is. It's a reminder. It's an image a memorial of what he said to me. So the Lord wants to do this in your life and so much more. So I'm encouraging you to open up to him. Let him into the places where you're having trouble forgiving yourself or other people or him. Doesn't matter. But let him in. He wants to be a part of the process. He wants to take more territory inside your heart. Because that is his throne. That is the core of who you are. And he wants to come in in a more meaningful way there. And it's your job to invite him in. To invite him in. Yes, Lord, come into this dark place. Come into this place that I'm afraid to face. Come in to the trauma that I have been denying and blocking out for the last 10 or 15 years. Come in and help me and heal me and show me how to forgive myself because I need you to show me how to forgive myself and give me a memorial. So that is God's will for you. I pray that you would listen to him and that you would follow what he says 
and I pray God's blessing and protection over you. And I will keep you in prayer over this issue because it is so important. So you guys remember to like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you in the next video.